two staying away from the first drink. Expressions commonly heard in AA are, if you don't take that first drink, you can't get drunk, and one drink is too many, but twenty are not enough. Many of us, when we first began to drink, never wanted or took more than one or two drinks. But as time went on, we increased the number. Then, in later years, we found ourselves drinking more and more, some of us getting and staying very drunk. Maybe our condition didn't always show in our speech or our gait, but by this time we were never actually sober. If that bothered us too much, we would cut down or try to limit ourselves to just one or two or switch from hard liquor to beer or wine. At least we tried to limit the amount so we would not get too disastrously drunk. Or we tried to hide how much we drank. But all these measures got more and more difficult. Occasionally, we even went on the wagon and did not drink at all for a while. Eventually, we would go back to drinking. Just one drink. And since that apparently did no serious damage, we felt it was safe to have another. Maybe that was all we took on that occasion, and it was a great relief to find we could take just one or two, then stop. Some of us did that many times, but the experience proved to be a snare. It persuaded us that we could drink safely. And then there would come the occasion, some special celebration, a personal loss, or no particular event at all, when two or three made us feel fine, so we thought one or two more could not hurt. And with absolutely no intention of doing so, we found ourselves again drinking too much. We were right back where we had been, over-drinking without really wanting to. Such repeated experiences have forced us to this logically inescapable conclusion. If we do not take the first drink, we never get drunk. Therefore, instead of planning never to get drunk or trying to limit the number of drinks or the amount of alcohol, we have learned to concentrate on avoiding only one drink, the first one. In effect, instead of worrying about limiting the number of drinks at the end of a drinking episode, we avoid the one drink that starts it. Sounds almost foolishly simplistic, doesn't it? It's hard for many of us now to believe that we never really figured this out for ourselves before we came to AA. Of course, to tell the truth, we never really wanted to give up drinking altogether either until we learned about alcoholism. But the main point is, we know now that this is what works. Instead of trying to figure out how many we could handle, four, six, a dozen, we remember, just don't pick up that first drink. It is so much simpler. The habit of thinking this way has helped hundreds of thousands of us stay sober for years. Doctors who are experts on alcoholism tell us that there is a sound medical foundation for avoiding the first drink. It is the first drink which triggers, immediately or some time later, the compulsion to drink more and more until we are in drinking trouble again. Many of us have come to believe that our alcoholism is an addiction to the drug alcohol. Like addicts of any sort who want to maintain recovery, we have to keep away from the first dose of the drug we have become addicted to. Our experience seems to prove this, as you can read in the book Alcoholics Anonymous and in our Grapevine magazine, and as you can hear wherever AA members get together and share their experiences. 3. Using the 24-Hour Plan In our drinking days, we often had such bad times that we swore, never again. We took pledges for as long as a year, or promised someone we would not touch the stuff for three weeks or three months. And of course, we tried going on the wagon for various periods of time. We were absolutely sincere when we voiced these declarations through gritted teeth. With all our hearts, we wanted never to be drunk again. We were determined. We swore off drinking altogether, intending to stay off alcohol well into some indefinite future. Yet, in spite of our intentions, the outcome was almost inevitably the living sober five same. Eventually, the memory of the vows and of the suffering that led to them faded. We drank again, and we wound up in more trouble. Our dry forever had not lasted very long. Some of us who took such pledges had a private reservation. We told ourselves that the promise not to drink applied only to hard stuff, not to beer or wine. In that way, we learned, if we did not already know it, that beer and wine could get us drunk too. We just had to drink more of them to get the same effects we got on distilled spirits. 
we wound up as drunk on beer or wine as we had been before on the hard stuff. Yes, others of us did give up alcohol completely and did keep our pledges exactly as promised until the time was up. Then we ended the drought by drinking again and were soon right back in trouble with an additional load of new guilt and remorse. With such struggles behind us now, in AA, we try to avoid the expressions on the wagon and taking the pledge. They remind us of our failures. Although we realize that alcoholism is a permanent, irreversible condition, our experience has taught us to make no long-term promises about staying sober. We have found it more realistic and more successful to say, I am not taking a drink just for today. Even if we drank yesterday, we can plan not to drink today. We may drink tomorrow. Who knows whether we'll even be alive then. But for this 24 hours, we decide not to drink. No matter what the temptation or provocation, we determine to go to any extremes necessary to avoid a drink today. Our friends and families are understandably weary of hearing us vow, this time I really mean it, only to see us lurch home loaded. So we do not promise them or even each other not to drink. Each of us promises only herself or himself. It is, after all, our own health and life at stake. We, not our family or friends, have to take the necessary steps to stay well, it at least for the present day or moment. Say, for the rest of this page, the 24-hour plan is very flexible. We can start it afresh at any time, wherever we are. At home, at work, in a bar or in a hospital room, at 4 p.m. or at 3 a.m. We can decide right then not to take a drink during the forthcoming 24 hours or 5 minutes. Continually renewed, this plan avoids the weakness of such methods as going on the wagon or taking a pledge. A period on the wagon and a pledge both eventually came, as planned, to an end. So, we felt free to drink again. But today is always here. Life is daily. Today is all we have. And anybody can go one day without drinking. First, we try living in the now just in order to stay sober. And it works. Once the idea has become a part of our thinking, we find that living life in 24-hour segments is an effective and satisfying way to handle many other matters as well. 4. Remembering that alcoholism is an incurable, progressive, fatal disease. Many people in the world know they cannot eat certain foods, oysters or strawberries or eggs or cucumbers or sugar or something else, without getting very uncomfortable and maybe even quite sick. A person with a food allergy of this kind can go around feeling a lot of self-pity, complaining to everyone that he or she is unfairly deprived and constantly whining about not being able or allowed to eat something delicious. Obviously, even though we may feel cheated, it isn't wise to ignore our own physiological makeup. If our limitations are ignored, severe discomfort or illness may result. To stay healthy and reasonably happy, we must learn to live with the bodies we have. One of the new thinking habits a recovering alcoholic can develop is a calm view of himself or herself as someone who needs to avoid chemicals, alcohol, and other drugs that are substitutes for it if he or she wants to maintain good health. We have as evidence our own drinking days, a total of hundreds of thousands of man or woman years of a whale of a lot of drinking. We know that, as the drinking years went by, our problems related to drinking continually worsened. Alcoholism is progressive. Oh, of course, many of us had periods when, for some months or even years, we sometimes thought the drinking had sort of straightened itself out. We seemed able to maintain a pretty heavy alcohol intake fairly safely, or we would stay sober except for occasional drunk nights, and the drinking was not getting noticeably worse as far as we could see. Nothing horrible or dramatic happened. However, we can now see that, in the long or short haul, our drinking problem inevitably got more serious. Some physicians expert on alcoholism tell us there is no doubt that alcoholism steadily grows worse as one grows older. Know anyone who isn't growing older? We are also convinced, after the countless attempts we made to prove otherwise, that alcoholism is incurable, just like some other illnesses. It cannot be cured in this sense. We cannot change our body chemistry and go back to being the normal, moderate social drinkers lots of us seem to be in our youth. As some of us put it, 
we can no more make that change than a pickle can change itself back into a cucumber. No medication or psychological treatment any of us ever had cured our alcoholism. Further, having seen thousands and thousands of alcoholics who did not stop drinking, we are strongly persuaded that alcoholism is a fatal disease. Not only have we seen many alcoholics drink themselves to death, dying during the withdrawal symptoms of delirium tremens, DTs, or convulsions, or dying of cirrhosis of the liver directly related to drinking. We also know that many deaths not officially attributed to alcoholism are in reality caused by it. Often, when an automobile accident, drowning, suicide, homicide, heart attack, fire, pneumonia, or stroke is listed as the immediate cause of death, it was heavy alcoholic drinking that led to the fatal condition or event. Certainly, most of us in AA felt safely far away from such a fate when we were drinking, and probably the majority of us never came near the horrible last stages of chronic alcoholism. But we saw that we could, if we just kept on drinking. If you get on a bus bound for a town a thousand miles away, that's where you'll wind up, unless you get off and move in another direction. Okay. What do you do if you learn that you have an incurable, progressive, fatal disease, whether it's alcoholism or some other, such as a heart condition or cancer? Many people just deny it is true, ignore the condition, accept no treatment for it, suffer and die. But there is another way. You can accept the diagnosis, persuaded by your doctor, your friends, or yourself. Then you can find out what can be done, if anything, to keep the condition under control, so you can still live many happy, productive, healthy years as long as you take proper care of yourself. You recognize fully the seriousness of your condition, and you do the sensible things necessary to carry on a healthy life. This, it turns out, is surprisingly easy in regard to alcoholism, if you really want to stay well. And since we AAs have learned to enjoy life so much, we really want to stay well. We try never to lose sight of the unchangeable fact of our alcoholism, but we learn not to brood or feel sorry for ourselves or talk about it all the time. We accept it as a characteristic of our body, like our height or our need for glasses, or like any allergies we may have. Then we can figure out how to live comfortably, not bitterly, with that knowledge as long as we start out by simply avoiding that first drink, remember, just for today. A blind member of AA said his alcoholism was quite similar to his blindness. Once I accepted the loss of my sight, he explained, and took the rehabilitation training available to me, I discovered I really can, with the aid of my cane or my dog, go anywhere I want to go quite safely, just as long as I don't forget or ignore the fact that I am blind, but when I do not act within the knowledge that I cannot see, it is then I get hurt or in trouble. If you want to get well, one AA woman said, you just take your treatment and follow directions and go on living. It's easy as long as you remember the new facts about your health. Who has time to feel deprived or self-pitying when you find there are so many delights connected with living happily unafraid of your illness? To summarize, we remember we have an incurable, potentially fatal ailment called alcoholism, and instead of persisting in drinking, we prefer to figure out and use enjoyable ways of living without alcohol. We need not be ashamed that we have a disease. It is no disgrace. No one knows exactly why some people become alcoholics while others don't. It is not our fault. We did not want to become alcoholics. We did not try to get this illness. We did not suffer alcoholism just because we enjoyed it, after all. We did not deliberately, maliciously set out to do the things we were later ashamed of. We did them against our better judgment and instinct because we were really sick and didn't even know it. We've learned that no good comes of useless regret and worry about how we got this way. The first step toward feeling better and getting over our sickness is quite simply not drinking. Try the idea on for size. Wouldn't you rather recognize you have a health condition which can be successfully treated than spend a lot of time miserably worrying about what's wrong with you? We have found this is a better looking and better feeling picture of ourselves than the old gloomy selves we used to see. It is truer, too. We know. The proof of it is in the way we feel, act, and think. Now. 
anyone who wants it is welcome to a free trial period of this new concept of self. Afterward, anyone who wants the old days again is perfectly free to start them all over. It is your right to take back your misery if you want it. On the other hand, you can also keep the new picture of yourself if you'd rather. It too is yours by right.